So would you guys welcome Greg Voros. Hey guys. Greg. Steve, thanks for so having me. So good to have you here. Thank you so much for being a part of this crazy night of keeping all this stuff together. This is a beautiful thing. I think this might be number 10. It, I think it very well may be Let's number 10. Let's get things 10. started, number 10, is that Yes, it? <laughs> yes. Uh, Greg is always uh, typically one of the earliest live lessons that we have in the year. I usually try and get him first, but we had some scheduling things that we had to work through, so it's, I'm not glad that we're now able to do it and uh, have you here. It's a beautiful thing. So let's, let's get uh, talking about a uh, couple of things. I have already written out. Just a bunch of questions, yeah. A bunch of questions. Yeah. Um, how long, first of all, how long have you been here at Groons? This is my, my 14th year. And what all are you in charge of at this stage <laughs> of the game? At this stage of the game? I, I, the repair shop. You head up the wonderful, yeah, legendary repair shop. Yeah, I up the repair, repair shop, shop, and it's a, it's a wonderful time, and that keeps me pretty busy. Yeah. You know, there's a lot going on within the store. Yeah. So I kind of, I, I do a number of things, but uh, the repair shop, that's my number one focus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I know you're heading up all of the repair guys. Do you get your hands behind the, always, on, on guitars? Yeah, always, Still? yeah. I mean, you know, here at the store, I mean, there's, there's eight full-time repair, repairmen that work here, um, and they're great. The, the repairmen here at Groons are fantastic, and they make my job easy, Yeah. you know, because they're so good at what they do, you know? Yeah. Um, but sure, I love repairing guitars. That's how, that's how it all started, and continues to move on for me. I love repairing, I love repairing guitars. That's, that's what I do. That's my okay. thing, you know? Good. I'm so glad you're part of our guitar family. You know, we had, uh, way back at our very first guitar conference, um, I had talked to a, uh, a friend of mine uh, that headed up Broadway music uh, down here on Broadway, uh, Lyle, and I was asking for someone to do a guitar setup workshop. And, uh, Lyle had suggested somebody over at Groons. I don't know mm -hmm. who I was originally calling. And uh, I called them. They didn't know who I was. I didn't know who they were. And I guess, I guess they didn't want to do it. And so they said, hey, Greg. Uh, it was perfect. I think I was at Groons for you know, a year or two at that point. And uh, we were on 4th and, and Broadway. And the Global Cafe was yep. just across the street. So yep. that when you called and you said, you asked whether or not a repair person could come by and teach a, a pretty straightforward class. I was like, yeah, I'll do it, you know, and that's not a problem. Where is it? Across the street, right around lunchtime? Yeah, that works for me. And it <laughs> ended up being, that was the start yeah. of uh, a wonderful It worked out fantastic, And now yeah. Greg is one of my closest friends. That's right. And we have uh, been through many a conferences now. Quite a few. And right. quite a few summer conferences, fall finger style conferences now. Yep, yep. Um, and all sorts, of, all sorts of things, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Greg also did a course that we had um, worked with, uh, Learn to Master Guitar Setup and Maintenance. So if you are interested in learning how to do some of this repair yourself, yeah. um, which I would recommend that you do, everybody needs to know how to do at least basic repair on their instrument, um, check it out. Just Learn to Master Guitar Setup and Maintenance with Greg Voris and you'll, you'll see that. Yeah, that'll um, do it. And, and if you guys want a sample of, of uh, what's on these videos, you can go on YouTube as well. They yeah. sampled it years back and there's a couple of cool little snippets of the, uh, the video on intonation, I think, maybe even stringing an instrument. There's a couple of things that you can check it out on YouTube, and then um, if, you guys, if you guys like it, then go ahead and, go ahead and check that out. If you, you know? Um, you know, I wanted to, I went back and went through my notes here. Uh, um, Greg is truly one of the top guitar uh, techs on the planet. And uh, I went back and looked, looked around, and Greg has worked on guitars uh, of uh, Gary Rossington from Leonard Skinner, Tommy Shaw from Styx. All the time, <laughs> actually, on Tommy. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, a great, uh, he's, a, he's, he's a great person, and he's a friend of the stores, so he's in here all the time, yeah. as are many, many folks, yeah. yeah. Elliot Easton from The Cars, yeah. uh, Jewel, yeah. um, Everlast, Roy Acuff, Chet Atkins, Les Paul, yeah. Brad Paisley, Steve Vai, yeah. all, of, the, all yeah. of these instruments have crossed over your sure. bench or, at or one time. At, at least one of their instruments at yeah. some point in time, yeah, yeah. you know. It's, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know. Before I was working at Groons, I, I, I was a full-time repair person in New York, mm -hmm. and um, I, I've stayed busy for the last 20 years, you know. I, I was fortunate to do this most of my adult life in repairing instruments, and that's what I wanted to do, and, and I'm still doing it, yeah. you know. So it's a beautiful thing, and um, yeah, it's great. You know what's interesting too, is uh, you made you made mention of, of guitar tech, like tech work, mm -hmm. right? 
that, that, that's interesting, because I, 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 I really got a chance to do some real deal tech work that's, last year. Oh, that's right, tell, right? The, tell the gang about that. Um, and then I'll get into the tech part of it. Yeah. So when I, when I train to be, um, to be a repair person, I train to be a proper repairman. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in um, rebuilding instruments, restoration work, you know, very specific work with regards to instruments, period spec, period correct on vintage instruments or whatever it might be. And uh, that's where my headspace was at, you know. And um, so last year I made a connection with some, uh, some guys, a, a phenomenal band. You guys should check them out. It's a band called the Ghost Hounds. And um, they're incredible. It's a rock and roll, bluesy, soulful kind of band, great bunch of guys. Well, they asked me to come out and do some, some tech work for them, some proper guitar tech work. On the road, okay? which is different from in much, the shop. Much, much different, you know, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was very different for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, well, there's gonna be a learning curve for me there and figuring out stage setup and all that good stuff. I should have hopped in and helped out here. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> you know? That's right. We didn't have a chance to check but, anything. But uh, that, was, that was phenomenal. It was, a, it was a great time. And this was not a small little club thing that they did right. this band opened up for it was huge the I rolling mean, stones rolling stones in in washington dc it was fantastic they willie opened nelson, up for willie nelson that was huge um, um zz top nine or ten dates with zz top bob seeger this band is really blowing up and and they sound fantastic yeah. they dropped an album last year they're gonna have another one coming out this year and um i had a wonderful time i love the music i thought the music was great it was it was a good time because everyone in the band is really cool yeah and i said all right let's let's give this a shot and i was glad i did yeah um we went from uh florida all the way up the east coast to pennsylvania connecticut i think yeah and um 10 or 11 shows you know nine of them were with yeah. zz top two with bob seeger yeah, big arena oh it was, it was, it, it, was, it was a great experience and 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 seeing that and how all of that looks and yeah. The live, uh, the live show in front of you know thousands of people in that way, being Johnny on the spot, and yeah. um, that to me is, is is a proper guitar tech. So I dabbled in that world. Yeah, it was great because I was it was at a high level. Yeah. You know? yeah, and it was really cool. But I'll tell you, there was a there was a learning curve there because it's a different it's a different thing. Yeah, it's a much much different thing than being a a repair person, um, where you have an instrument in front of you, you get to you get to work on it, big restoration projects where you're intimate with the instrument for months at a time. Months at a time. Everything is very low key. Everyone's very patient. It's very vibey in that way. Mm -hmm. And tech work is not like that. There's, you, you got to be Johnny on the spot and yeah. things happen quick yeah. and um, so on and so forth. But it, it was, a, it was a wonderful time. And I thank these guys for having me out. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was a great time. It was fun. And you've been doing quite a bit of stuff now with uh, Premier Guitar Magazine. Lots yeah, of, Premier uh, Guitar, yeah. Uh, uh, videos I've seen it uh, with you out. And I saw one just the other day, Grunson put up with you and Tom Bukovec, who we would Bukovec, love to get yeah. you uh, get, on the, get on the show sometime. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, tr what tremendous playing. Oh, it's unbelievable. Oh, unbelievable. unbelievable. I, I just sat there interviewing Tom for, uh, you know, whatever it was, 20 minutes, yeah. and I was floored sitting there. And um, Tom's a great friend, and, and, and every time he picks up a guitar, he floors everyone around him. You yeah. know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. He's a great player. With Premiere, I've had the Premiere guitar, the Axes and Artifacts um, series that I do with John Bollinger. Yep. Um, that's been out for a number of years, and we stay pretty busy. I got some more coming up here with John, and, and uh, we stay busy, you know, just stay busy, and, and this is fun. Well, it's a good time. Um, thank you for making time to be with us. Let's get into some guitar care sure. stuff that, that folks are going to want to know about know about i know we've talked a lot about in the past when you've been here and there's all kinds of questions winter time lots of heated air around so the question always becomes gets back to humidity especially yep. on acoustic instruments yeah get you get yourselves a humidifier i'm i've been doing something for a number of years now um that i think is very very important so when folks get a humidifier at their local drugstore or whatever it might be when they don't have a need for it any longer when the dry cold season is over they go ahead and put it in the closet mm -hmm. and they take it back out again for the following year to yeah. to go ahead and um, humidify their their rooms or, or homes in that way usually it's an isolated room mm -hmm. what i've been doing for a long long time now is when that dry season is over i throw out my humidifier just get rid of it i just get rid of it completely because there's mold that grows in there there's filters you're supposed to replace you're really supposed to give it a really good cleaning every year yeah or else i mean that that's what you're breathing in yeah you know and you're supposed to use from what i understand distilled water mm -hmm. i don't i use mm -hmm. tap water i get a 15 dollar humidifier 
um, and then I run that for the for the dry season. And mm -hmm. when it's when it's over, I just go ahead and throw it out. What's what is the proper humidity that ideally you should have for an acoustic instrument? Forty five percent humidity. Forty five. That's what you shoot for. Now there's windows. I've I've been on the show before where I say all right, forty five to fifty five percent. You know, in a perfect world between if if you land between forty five and fifty percent humidity, you're you're doing really well. Mm -hmm. I would get a hygrometer is very important. Where would you? Where would an average person get one of those? Uh, hardware store. You can get it at your local, you know, Home Depot, Home or something Depot, like that. whatever it might be. That's another ten dollar. Uh, um, uh, it's just an accurate way to measure the humidity in your in your home. It's it's interesting how many times um, folks ask me this question, and then I tell them where your humidity should be in percentage, what percent humidity you should have in your house, and they always tell me what temperature it is in their house. Yeah. Well, Greg, it's like seventy-two degrees in my house. I understand that. That's fine, but this is a humidity. Different thing. It's a much, much different thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so anytime, especially when I wake up in the morning, you know, especially when it's dry out, you can, you can feel how dry it is, you know? And yeah. your instruments are, are thirsty as well. You Chances know? are, if you live someplace other than maybe Seattle, um, right. it, y your house is going to normally be on the drier end of the spectrum right. from 45%. 45% is, is, is a little bit more... Uh, moist than you would typically have in an average home, especially during the winter months uh, when there's so much heated air blowing right. around. And there's some, there's some ways that you can tell if your instrument is dry. dry. Yep. Like if we have uh, an instrument here, what are some ways that would be indications that would say, oh, well, this instrument is too dry. Well, first things first, you, you could always tell by the frets. If you have sharp frets or fret ends. If you're running your hand yeah. along it and you feel those sharp ends. You feel the, you know, the, the board is going to dry out a little bit. The, the fret is going to stay put and you'll feel that your frets are a little sharp, mm -hmm. you know, butter knives, you'll feel them a little bit. That's a good indicator. If you have a flat top guitar, um, you could look at the top. Mm -hmm. a flat top guitar isn't necessarily flat. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to have a radius to it. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at your instrument and it's almost has a dished in appearance to the top, it's Where would dry. that be? Kind of around right here around or around, around this there? Area, right yeah. around the top, right behind the bridge and that belly area. If you see that dip in, that's another indicator that your instrument is dry. And when, if, it, if it gets to a certain point or dry enough, then what will happen is your bridge starts to lift up and that glue joint um, weakens. Yeah. How so many times have you... Have you been and you've looked at an instrument and there's a little bit of airspace, a little bit of a right. crack right here on the back of the bridge where that's just starting to come up. That's one of the key yeah. signs that your instrument is too dry. Right. So the top, the bridge may be lifting, your frets might be a hair sharp. It's, it's a good idea to get some humidity into your uh, room. Another cool tip is to get all of the instruments in your house. First of all, it's very picturesque to keep them around the fireplace. We've talked about this before. Keep them away from the fireplace maybe keep them in one room that you can easily control by way of a humidifier, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's what I do myself. I keep all the instruments in one room, yeah. and I make that my humidor, the, 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 the room that's set at a constant 48%, 46 to 48%, and, um, and I know that it, they're nice and healthy and happy in there. And you don't need to go crazy with it, but you just need to not be stupid with your instrument. Um, F doing foolish things with sure. your instrument. Setting, I love a good roaring fire, and I love the look of a guitar next to it. It's very picturesque, but your guitar really is wood, yep. and that fire is sucking that, mm. that any humidity that's already in the air, it's sucking it out, and so your guitar is just turning into a desert right. when and you do th and things like that. Uh, totally, and also keep in mind that the inside, like an acoustic guitar, an archtop guitar, the inside of the instrument is unfinished. Yeah. It's unfinished, you know. So um, electric guitars, because they're encapsulated in this, in this finish, this candy-coated finish, <laughs> yep. that, you know, in including the neck many times, um, electric guitars are way more hardy than, yeah. uh, than acoustic guitars, you know. Um, but, you know, th your electric guitars can dry out as well. So just, you know, pay attention and um, keep your eye on, on your instruments, yeah. Most of the average damage that's going to occur to your instrument is going to be humidity related yeah. in many in many things so uh, yeah. it's not something that y you could fix it so if your guitar is too dry there's there's in you know in the sound hole sort of humidifiers mm -hmm. dampets and things like that which Here, we've used yeah here's the good thing they all work yeah so people ask me all the time what what do you like to you know what do you recommend the dampet 
uh, you know, different manufacturing companies make different gels and tubes and sticks that everyone sticks into their instrument, whatever it might be. All of them are fantastic because they're all going to do the same thing. Yeah. They're all great, but you got to use them. Yeah. They're all great. You know, bridge lifting, top cracks, yeah. you know, maybe you hear a pop in the middle of the night. That could very well be a, a top crack, you know, yeah. when, when an instrument dries out. Another cool sign or another thing to look for is if you notice your action drop, it almost seems like you pick, play your, your guitar daily, whatever it might be, and one day you pick it up and you notice the action drop significantly. Mm -hmm. That's also an indicator that your instrument is starting to dry or, or something happened yeah. the, you know, the previous day or that night where that, the humidity levels dropped in your house. Right. So I, I'd be mindful of that too. But yeah, as far as humidifiers, all of them work. I just use a room humidifier at this point, you know? Yeah. Um, and if I keep my instruments out, that's one thing. They're a little bit more protected if you keep them in the case, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Um, that's helpful. Yeah. That's helpful. And there's in-case humidifiers mm -hmm. as well that you, that you can buy. Um, another thing that's, the, that's a common source of damage for your instrument is just knocking around. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it falls or you don't have a good enough, uh, 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 you know, good guitar holder or something to mm -hmm. hold your instrument and they just take a fall or uh, you know your kid or your dog walks by and, and knocks it over or something so you w it's always a good idea to um, have your guitar in a safe place either up on a on a hanger like some of these we've got hangers a lot of folks will just hang them on the wall that's good that's up that's out of the way um, uh, or to store it in its case uh, as long as it's best. close by don't put it that's right you know too far away because you want to get to it but that's its home in a perfect world they would live in the case and uh, you know until they're being played yeah you know um, in a perfect world speaking of cases um, a good hard uh, hard shell acoustic case is a great thing for your electrics as well uh, they are heavier <coughs> they are durable though um, but I use a lot of bags because I'm always carrying my instrument too so you can get bags too but you want to make sure that they have a lot of uh, foam on them you know that you can get really cheap ones that hardly have any foam on them Avoid those. That's kind of the lowest end of, of that. And that if your guitar falls in one of those, it's not going to protect right. it very much. Right. So. Right. All right. A couple of things. Um, guitar setups. Yeah. How, how often should an average player who plays maybe three hours a week or something like that, how often should they get a guitar setup done? I would imagine once a year would be fine. You know, once good rule of thumb. Once, once a, a year, year taken in, I would wait till the, the bigger season changes have, have passed by and take it into your local shop or go ahead and do it yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of, of teaching you guys or everyone for that matter how to, how to do their own work mm -hmm. properly. And um, I think everyone should be able to set up their own instruments or make slight adjustments to, to, to help out the, the playability of their instruments. So that's a, that's a big one, you know. Um, the... Um, on a, for a guitar setup, what what does that entail to those that not be may not be as familiar with it? What what do they physically do to your instrument? It it, it would be um, the instrument is stripped of the strings, uh, mm -hmm. the guitar is cleaned up, the fingerboard is um, hydrated properly, mm -hmm. um, the frets are cleaned. Any of the, the funk that you know the residue that might be on the frets or the board gets cleaned up. The entire instrument gets cleaned. Um, the hardware gets tightened, that might loosen up, yep. you know. The instrument gets strung, mm -hmm. okay, with a new set of strings. And in this order, the setup is carried out. So the neck gets adjusted first by way of the truss rod. You can either find that at the peg head or the sound hole, okay. So the, the neck gets adjusted first. The action, step number two, gets adjusted either the saddle or the bridge. In the case of an acoustic guitar, it's going to be your saddle. In height, you adjust for the action. You dial in your nut slots as step number three, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so that your string doesn't, isn't getting ca caught. It, it's not getting caught, and, and your nut really has, has two jobs. It's supposed that's, to That's this part right there, there. The nut spaces the strings, and it gets you over the first fret. Mm -hmm. that, that's really the, the, really the only job that the nut does, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you only hear the nut when you're playing a string open, mm -hmm. Right, because when you're playing a bar chord or you're fretting a note, you're really hearing the f the fret in your finger. Mm -hmm. Right, so the job of your nut is to space the strings properly and to get you past the first fret. Once it's doing that, your nut is doing its job. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So neck adjustment first, action saddle or bridge. If it's an electric guitar, it's going to be the bridge or the saddle individually. Mm -hmm. 
it's going to be a Les Paul, it's going to be a Bridge or a Gibson, whatever it might be, but the action gets adjusted um, in this area, but saddle or bridge. The nut slots get dialed in, step mm -hmm. number three. Mm -hmm. um, if it has, if it's an electric guitar, you do your pickup height and intonation being step four and step five. But th yeah. That's a proper setup in that order, and that's what should be carried out when you, when you bring one into your local music store. Um, how do you find a good guitar tech in your area? It, it's really hard. It's really hard. Um, I, I would imagine you'd go, um, we've talked about this too, I yeah. mean, word of mouth. Yeah. Word of mouth, you know. Um, there's all sorts of folks doing repair work across the country, you know. Usually the ones that are, um, that are really good, they have a name for themselves in, in small circles, whatever it might be. So, you know, talk to other guitar players. Yeah. And, um, you know, folks that have been around and who they use as a repair person, referrals in that way are, um, go a long way. Yeah, you can generally find, um, find the right people. Just start asking around the real musicians. Just, and it's, it's, guys are real open to that. Just say, hey, man, who works in your instruments? Mm -hmm. And you can generally find uh, that. Um, if you go down to your, just your local box music store, um, you may get someone who knows what they're doing. You may get someone with less experience there. So it's a good idea to always ask around. Now, having said that, you can save yourself a lot of money mm -hmm. Um, by learning how to do some of these repairs yourself. And I think you should. I, I think and I think you should. should. Yep. I think everyone should, you know. And um, I know a lot of repairmen all over the country. I, I, I could think of very few repairmen that make their livelihood off of setups. Mm -hmm. Very, very few. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just one of the things that come with being a proper repairman or repair person is a setup. But, uh, but I've always said it. A setup is something that, a, that, go, that accompanies other projects that you're doing, you know. Um, bridge re-glue, fret work, refret, broken peg head, whatever it might be, that's work. When you finish that, you go ahead and set up the instrument. Mm -hmm. Everything gets a setup. That yeah. should be 101. Those yeah. are the basics of it, you know? Yeah. So I think you guys should do it yourself. So once a year would be a good idea to really service your instrument, but, um, you know, if you're changing your strings every couple of weeks, couple of months, depending on how much you guys are playing, it's, it's a good idea to maintain your instrument so you don't have to have it done once a year. As long as you make little tweaks as you're moving along on your instrument um, a few times a year, okay, you don't have to have a major overhaul once a year. Yeah. The, the tweaks are important. Your guitar, it, it, it's, it's drying out, it's getting more humidity, it's getting cold, it's getting hot. It, it's just naturally kind of going to need some adjustment routinely. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of doing. Now, you mentioned changing strings. Um, for just an average player who's playing a few hours a week there, um, if you could, you know, I generally don't want to go over three months on a, on a, a set of strings. Now, it's not going to hurt the instrument, but they're going to get gunky after a while, and they're not going to sound very good. So uh, it's, you should be changing your strings um, regularly on that. Now, as a, as a person that's changing their strings, Let's talk about just some of the basics, basics of that. Uh, I know I have guys ask me about how many windings we mm -hmm. should have on the, on the top. Is there any rule of thumb for that? I, I like to have um, three, three wraps on your wound strings and uh, maybe five, maybe six on your unwound strings. Yep. As you're, as you're tying that string around, this is something that, that someone taught me, uh, maybe even been you. Um, you put that string through the, the, the peg head and then on the unwound strings, like your first, second, and, and uh, perhaps third, um, sometimes you want that string, I like to have it cross over itself as it's winding around on that peg head. So when it tightens, it's locking itself in, as opposed to if I just kind of wrapped string around my finger and pulled mm -hmm. without doing it, it would just unwind. Mm -hmm. So if you find that you're going out of tune all the time, your strings aren't staying put, Make sure that as you're winding them, they're crossing over themselves. That's right. Yeah. It, there's, there's a few different ways to do it, um, and they all, they all do the job, yeah. I, I think. Just, I would also add to it, just be sure that your strings, as they're wrapping around the post, that they're going down. Down. Not, you don't want to be wrapping up, right. and therefore there, it's not pulling right. enough against that right. nut as it's going the, over. The, the instrument, I mean, if you look at the, the peg head of, of the instrument, it has, a, it has a look to it where everything comes from the center going out. So it really does look like a flower, you know, mm -hmm. in, the way, in the way that it's strung, you know. Without fail, you'll always see some strings that go the opposite way. Well, it's not only a problem because it's aesthetically wrong or it's not pleasing, but the nut isn't made 
to go that way to to, to be pulled on in that way yeah. you know so what you want is straight string pull for the most part and you want the strings to go down in the the angle of the peg head naturally going downward yeah. you know that's pretty important yeah we have a couple of questions there uh, Albert uh, Seva is saying, do you need to humidify an electric guitar kept in a case? N not as much as yeah, an acoustic. Yeah, not as much. I wouldn't worry about it so much. Now, if the surrounding conditions are in the teens, like 15% humidity in your house, th and, and it's in your case, I would still worry about it. Uh, you know, I would still worry about it because yeah. it can happen fast, oh, it, relatively fast. I mean, think about this. If you have if you have your house between 40 and 50% humidity, and then overnight it dumps down to 10%, mm -hmm. do you have to worry? Mm. No, not really. You'd be okay for a number of days. It really has to stay down there for some time. Your instrument is gonna absorb what it wants and it's gonna hang on to it. It'll take you know, a day or two before it starts to dry out again. Mm -hmm. you know? So you know, people always ask me and they're, they're calling in a panic, oh my God, this happened, what should I do? Yeah. You're okay, odds yeah. are you're okay. Here are the things that I would look for, and that will tell you if your instrument is dry. To, um, it, like Greg um, said, pay attention to how much of your wood is actually exposed. Of, of just not, it's not shellacked over, it's, it's exposed. Like the whole inside of an acoustic would be exposed. If you have some sort of like a 335 or an arch top or something like that, electric, well, a lot more of that instrument on the inside is exposed right. and so it would be much more susceptible to humidity changes than something like this that's right which is i mean just just kind of think of it if i take a uh, you know a paper towel and i put uh, dump it in water and wring it out it's damp if i laid it out on the counter all night long it's going to get dry but if i put the same thing and put it in a ziploc baggie and that's zipped it. it up it's it's going to stay pretty pretty solid pretty good when this thing is all shellacked over with paint and, and stuff like that, it, the wood is just not as exposed. Yeah, this thing is candy coated. Every, everything about it is candy coated. The neck, it's maple board, completely finished over. The body, the same thing, you yeah. know? So you're okay. Now there's different finishes, right? Yeah. There's different finishes that are a hair more hardy than, than others. So if you have something like a, um, a poly, uh, a poly finish, polyvinyl, um, there's there's a different a whole family of poly finishes there those are pretty solid because once they cure they become rock hard yeah okay it's almost uh, almost the epoxy of, yeah. of, of, of finishes in that way when that cures it's solid it, it, it it's really it's not going to move around uh -huh. okay that's a, a way more hardy finish than say a nitrocellulose lacquer okay that always stays soft that's the beauty of, of, of nitro lacquer in that way and that's why it sounds a certain way too is that the wood is able to resonate yeah you see on vintage guitars when you have that really cool vintage look where the finish sinks inside of the pores and it mm. starts to check and all that good stuff well it allows the top or the sides or whatever it might be on, on a guitar to vibrate a certain way so it's going to sound different but it's going to be less hardy kept in that finish than say a finish like like this instrument yeah. so it, it does make a difference in what kind of finish it is but for the most part as a as a general rule acoustic guitars need a little bit more attention than, than electric guitars or basses yeah um ehrman 2004 is saying uh do you use any conditioner or oil on the fretboard i do i yep. do um uh, conditioner is is cool but not necessarily for the same reasons that everyone else uses it, right? Mm -hmm. So when I use a fingerboard conditioner, in part, it, it's so that the, the board, the open uh, wood could, could absorb some of that oil, right? So it could, it could keep for a longer period of time without drying like this instrument. This is finished over. It wouldn't absorb, so this one wouldn't need any oil. But I like to use but oil. But that one would because yeah. there's not a finish right. there. Right. Now, if you think about it, people hose down the necks with oil, mm -hmm. right? And then they spread it around with a little steel wool, fine grade steel wool, and it absorbs into the, the pores of the wood. Okay, you know, at the end of the day, how much is your board actually absorbing of that oil that you sprayed on it? Most of it is gonna get wiped off, Yeah. right? So what it does for a repair person is it acts like a lubricant for the steel wool. So you don't leave any scratches in the frets either, All right. you know? So it does double duty for a repair person. It, it hydrates your board and you can go ahead and clean up your frets make them really shine and look really good and like i said the lubricant will make it so that there'll be zero scratches if you use the proper four grade steel wool now um 
What about guitar polishes and mm -hmm. things like that for, for polishing off the finish? Is there any things to look for in that? I like, I mean, there's so many polishes nowadays that are out there, and I think they all do a, a, a phenomenal job. No one makes a bad product anymore. Like, if we went back 20 years, 20 oh, yeah. plus years, we can have a field day with how many folks are making strings that you don't like, mm -hmm. polishes that aren't worth a whatever, and so on and so forth. I think things have gotten figured out. It's 2020. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have a bad product and be in business mm -hmm. for a long time. We yeah. have the internet. Yeah. It'll, yeah. Get, it'll exactly. get sorted out on the internet, right? So I think everyone makes a good product now. If you go into a music store, these stores have dealerships, and um, if, if they're carrying a product, it's probably a pretty good product. If, you, you, if, it's, if it says guitar polish you're on good. it, you're, you're generally pretty good. Now, you don't want to use furniture polish, anything waxy, no. pledge, anything no. like that. It's just, I mean, it's not going to hurt your guitar. No. It's just going to make it, you know, slick and waxy. Uh, and, and it's going to show smudges and okay. things like that. The only one thing I would, I would look out for is, uh, is on a vintage guitar. Yeah. Okay, and, and what you don't want to change is its sheen. Mm -hmm. you, you never want to change the sheen. There's nothing, in my opinion, that looks worse. Well, there's a lot of things that looks, look worse than what I'm about to say. Yeah, yeah. But in general, on vintage guitars, what I don't want is a brand new looking finish. You, you, you never want to take it to a buffing wheel. Mm -hmm. You never want to take a polish that's going to make it super shiny as if it was brand new, because that's not what that instrument is. Yeah. You know, I never want to see that. Yeah. Um, there are some products out there. I mean, when, when I did Professor Green's, that was one of the things mm -hmm. that I really loved about the product when we would formulate it is that it didn't change the sheen. So it went ahead and cleaned the finish beautifully, but it didn't alter the sheen. It was yeah. just clean and it was still that matted vintage yeah. look. Yeah. You know, that's what I would look for. If you have an old guitar with a really cool patina to the finish, I wouldn't just go ahead and take a, a you know, a guitar polish to it. I might think of maybe some soap and water and just start working small areas to see how much of that nicotine or that dirt comes off if it's really filthy. Yeah. You know? And if it's not, I'd say, I'd say let it be. But I'd have that guitar be, um, you know, not, not to say that it would be dirty or fingerprints or whatever it might be, but there's, a, you know, there's, there's something that happens to an instrument where you, you take a polish to it and it just becomes too shiny. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. Loses, it loses something. Um, uh, we have another question here. How do I fix a stripped screw on my tuner? It's a Washburn acoustic in this particular example. Um, if, we're talking about, if we're talking about a tuner screw, you know, that goes into the machine head in the back, usually you have, well, we can talk about this. Usually you have, if it's a Grover, you'll have one on the bottom. If it's, say, a Ping or a Godo, you'll have one screw off to the side. Mm -hmm. If it's a Cluson style tuner, you'll have one up top, one below it. Mm -hmm. Vintage style, Gibsons, Les Pauls, whatever it might be, SGs, they all are going to have these Cluson style tuners. Sometimes that screw gets a little, uh, gets a little loose, you know? So I've seen people really overthink this by getting a dowel and plugging it and cutting it flush and drilling a hole the perfect diameter of your screw. Or you can take a little sliver off of a toothpick, throw it in the hole, and that will go ahead and fill up all the space that made the screw be get loose in the first place. Yeah. You know? Um, and that's what I would do. Yeah. And if you need to, um, if you, as long as it's not a vintage instrument, but just on a regular instrument, I know I've done this. If you have, uh, and the tuners are starting to go, or perhaps they weren't very good tuners to start off with, and you're constantly wrestling with tuning and issues like that, hey, go get a good set of tuners. Yep. It's well worth the... 40 bucks or so to get a decent set of tuners on there and it makes all the difference in the world it does and and the good thing about it being 2020 now is that there's so many different manufacturers out there where you don't have to change the footprint of what you already have yeah. to upgrade in that way i think every single combination of a tuner could be found so that you don't have to ream out the holes or drill extra screw holes or whatever it might be there's so many so many tuning machines on the market today that you can find as a direct swap yeah. install. And, and for that, you do not need a repair person. You can definitely do that yourselves. Uh, Neil ES 335 our wonderful moderator, is saying, why does the G-string on Gibson guitars often go out of tune? Well, when you guys figure well, that one out. There you go. <laughs> it does seem to be a thing about the, uh, the G-string. It goes back down to, I don't know if it's the... Uh, 
if it's tempering the of the or the tuners or themselves tuners because themselves. you know and then you, you know you I, I i can speculate the vintage style tuners they never hold incredibly well the pitch of the peg head um, i mean there's a number of things that we can speculate on there um, if you're doing an electric they can adjust these uh these two these uh, uh points down here and that will ever so slightly change the intonation of your instrument. It's a good thing to check every now and then. If right. you find that, wow, my tuner says that I'm in tune, but I start playing chords right. and I'm out of tune. Well, well, oh my goodness, what's, gone? Right. what's going on? Well, it's because your intonation down here, which they're not supposed to be all straight. I mean, they can, they can you know, you're supposed to have a little bit of adjustment. A lot of times, even on an acoustic, you'll see... Um, you know, that second string, I believe, yep. will be compensated compensated yep. on a saddle. So instead of a straight saddle, you'll have this one little notch in it over that second string. So there's a natural stagger pattern on both electric and acoustic guitars. You know, you'll see it on strats, tellies, whatever it might be. If you look at the saddles, there's a, a natural stagger pattern from EAD, GBE, right? Mm -hmm. Naturally, okay. So that's an intonation-related um, thing where every note on the, on the guitar's Fretboard should be one and the same, and how you adjust for that is by way of its intonation with regards to its scale length. I'll get into that in a second. With the initial question of the G string, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the question is, 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 is valid, why is it that the G string naturally slips out of tune on an instrument? So you come back and it just keeps kind of, kind of slipping on you. So there's a number of things, and there's a few things that you can do to prevent that from happening, like making sure that when you string your instrument, you have enough wraps around the tuner, okay? One. Um, two, you want to be sure that the nut itself is opened up to accept that string, that specific string, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've noticed this, especially on a bend or when you're tuning your instrument, you might hear a little pop, mm -hmm. a little creak as it moves. Well, what that's telling me is that the slot, the nut slot itself, isn't the right diameter for the string. It's catching. So it's catching as it's moving as it's moving along. So if you look at um, we can go back to the peg head, and how the D and the G strings. I don't know if you guys can get this, but the D and the G strings have the sharpest have the sharpest angle coming from the nut itself uh -huh. to the tuning post uh -huh. to the tuner's post itself. Okay. What's really important is that anytime I, I, I'm making a Gibson nut or I'm working on a Gibson instrument, that I cut out the back end of the, of the nut itself, because mm -hmm. that's what's going to uh, ha have that creaking or that little popping happen is on the back end of the nut. Okay? So the name of the game is the string to sit inside of the nut and to rest and make contact at the exact point where it touches and meets the fingerboard. Okay, uh -huh. not behind it. It's exactly where it meets the fingerboard. That's why all nuts have a, a general shape to them where they fall away, fall away. usually yeah. matching the angle of the peg head going back. But the reason that is is because when you cut the nut, you cut the back side out so it only rests exactly where the fingerboard starts. Yeah, you know. So by doing these few things, by stringing it properly, by being sure that it's not catching in the nut. Uh -huh. Okay. That'll help you out with staying in tune. Yeah. Automatically. Now, why does a G string go out of tune over every other string, especially on a Gibson? I don't know. That's the that's the million dollar question. Million dollar question. <laughs> but there's there. a lot of things that you can do um, to keep your I instrument staying in tune. Uh, th thank you, Greg. Let's. Uh, I'll let you catch your breath here for a second. Um, if you're mechanically minded, if th if this kind of uh, uh, you know, repair and, and taking care of your instrument and uh, uh, learning how to care for your instrument is, is, is something that you'd like to learn more about. Um, Greg does do some workshops. In fact, you've got one coming up in, in uh, Nazareth. I saw at I the do. Nazareth Guitar Institute coming up in April. April. April 25th and 26th. Our guys can put up the link for that. Um, yeah. W wonderful, good folks up there at the Nazareth Guitar Institute. Yeah, I love those guys. And uh, what will you cover in a workshop like that? Just a weekend, it's a so, Saturday and a Sunday. So every time, it's a beautiful thing. Every time we put up a, a weekend workshop like that, it sells out pretty quick. So we usually have a few mm -hmm. dates. And I love mm -hmm. working with the, with the Nazareth boys. Those guys are Dynamite, Dale, and Tyler Unger. Um, yeah. I love them. They're fantastic. So it's, it's, to me, it's always incomplete to do a, to do a class, whether it be a one-day or a two-day class, that covers just setup work mm -hmm. because it's never enough. A setup is, is something that 
you can only really carry out if there's other things that are working in your favor. Mm -hmm. So I always thought a, a setup class was incomplete if you didn't couple it with a proper fretwork class. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that we do day number one is um, we make sure that all the frets are seated. Mm -hmm. Okay, I go through the function of the instrument, how the truss rod works, every nook and cranny. And it's, it's a hands-on. Oh, it's hands-on. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, everyone brings instruments to work on, and we get busy. We get into it, you yeah. know. And so, you know, uh, the first thing that we cover is a fret dress, a proper fret dress. So two or three hours uh, into the class, after, you, you know, after I, I do my thing for about an hour and a half, two hours, you're in it. The strings are off your guitar, and you're taking sandpaper, and you're sanding on a sanding stick, stick the tops of your frets. We're crowning frets. We're getting in there. We're making sure that the foundation, the platform, or your foundation, which is the fingerboard and the frets, are exactly where we want them. Yeah. Okay? Everything is, is perfect. There's no raised frets. Your pitting is gone. You have the perfect foundation to build the setup on top of. Yeah. Day number two, now we can start properly on a setup. Yeah. Okay. And that's, in my opinion, the order to do it. And you could really troubleshoot as you, as you move along on why certain things happen. Why do you have a buzz here? Why is it buzzing open? Why is it buzzing on the third fret? Why are these things happening? Well, if you go in this order and you teach it in this way by focusing on the fret work first and then the setup, a lot of those questions answer themselves. Yeah. So day number two, people come up to me and say, hey, Greg, it's something just hit me. All right, what was that? Oh man, this is probably happening like this because, you know, my truss rod is slightly back, but I'll give it a little relief. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. So what I teach folks is 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 how to think about your repair projects, you know, and mm -hmm. it's methodical. It's it's really in, in 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 proper steps, but it's it's a way to go about approaching your instrument, not as a musician, as a guitar mechanic. Yeah. As a guitar repair person. Yeah. You know. So that's what I try to really you know hammer home. One of the things that. Uh, at our guitar conferences that we have, our summer guitar conference, uh, Guitar Gathering 2020.com, if you're interested in being part of that, um, is Greg does some, some uh, he's every day there, he's working on instruments and setting up instruments. And so if you want to have Greg actually work on your instrument, one of the benefits of coming to the summer conferences uh, and, the, and the fall conference as well is getting Greg to actually work on your instrument. So. Um, while I'm talking about that, if you're interested in our conferences, they're, they're coming up. We've got June 10th through the 13th is our Guitar Gathering uh, 2020. You can go to guitargathering2020.com. We've got workshops and jam groups. We're going to try a few things different this year. We're going to try and separate folks out by skill level a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to helping people out a little bit more by getting them a little bit more special. Uh, specialized instruction on that. We've got some incredible special guests, Parker Hastings, um, Thumb Picker of the Year, uh, Joe Robinson, uh, Australia's Got Talent winner. We've got David Greer, ar arguably one of the best flat picking guitarists on the planet, and then Robin Ford, uh, Grammy winning uh, uh, blues guitarist. So just a legendary um, setup. If you're interested, um, check it out. We won the Acoustic Guitar Magazine's Player's Choice Award for best guitar camp several, uh, several years back. It's one of the best camps in the country. And I would, uh, would also like to say it is one of the most affordable camps in Agreed. the country too. You go out and try and price some of these things. So Agreed. check it out. It's June 10th through the 13th. If you're interested in more finger style stuff, we have a fall event, a fall finger style retreat out at a wonderful retreat center this year. Uh, Greg's been with us, Ju Julio's been with us for that. And uh, we're having Clive Carroll, uh, phenomenal uh, English fingerstyle guitarist. Antoine DeFour is going to be with us. It is a cr incredibly great time. I think it's like October 30th through November 1st this year. So you can go to fingerstyleretreat.com and uh, get all the information about that. I will say one more thing. The, the conferences are fantastic for, for anyone that hasn't attended. I think I've done all of them at this point, yep. minus the one fall finger style. Yeah, that you were out of town for, yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry I missed that. No, no. Um, the instruction is, is, is top notch, it's phenomenal. It really is top notch. Every time I go, because I'm there, once in a while when I'm not buried in guitars, I'll pop my head up and I'll go and sit, stand in the back and just listen in. Yeah. Everyone is fantastic. Corey Congilio, every single person that comes in is world-class instructor. Yeah. 
it really is phenomenal and a great bang for the buck too. Yeah. Um, and in the evening, there's shows. Johnny Highland last year tore it up. Tore it up. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Everyone yeah. has a really good time, and it's a good community of folks too. Um, yeah. And it just seems to be getting better and better. I love it. If you if you if you're sitting at work, and you think, gosh, a few days in Nashville playing guitar, that does sound fun. Um, check it out. They're really good. And I also have some ideas for a jazz event. I can't let loose the details on that, but it's coming together. And a big piece of it came together this week. <laughs> so, um, all right, that's enough of that. I should play a little bit because yes, I have hardly played at all except for a cracking amp thing. So let me, uh, let me just play a little something here um, and then we'll uh, answer a few more questions and get out of here. inspired with a um, Tom Bukovec stuff so I don't know let me just mess around There you go. A little noodling around in A minor there. Um, all right. Let's uh, answer a couple of more questions there. And I have, I have something, um, um, some questions that folks had sent in as well. Locking, uh, locking tuners are fantastic. Yeah, someone was asking about, uh, William Nelson was asking about locking tuners. Talk That's, about those. It's Willie Nelson. William Nelson. Yeah, fantastic. I love locking tuners. They're, they're great. They have to be strung properly. Um, and they're, they're, they could vary a little bit, but locking tuners are fantastic. I, I don't know what happened in the uh, 80s going into the 90s and then later in the 2000s. They kind of got out of favor there. Yeah, I don't know why. It, 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 for folks that like staying in tune, locking tuners are great. Yeah. A little higher maintenance than... than Maybe a hair. It, but, but not much. I mean, not as much as, as uh, uh, you know, some of the other mm -hmm. things that you could do to your guitar. But, like, these are... Uh, 
have a locking mechanism on the back of them, and I love it. They're fantastic. Yeah. They're great. Paul Reed Smith makes a great version of one. The wheels on the back. Who, who makes the, the tuners? Grovers, maybe? No, these are Schallers. Schaller makes Schallers. a great um, locking tuner. Grover makes a great locking tuner. I would imagine everyone makes a locking tuner nowadays, and they also make a locking tuner that goes with the exact same footprint as your existing tuner. I like them. I don't like going out They're of tune. You know? And, you know, um, the other thing that's super important, whether you have locking tuners or not, and a lot of people don't realize that how important it is, is to stretch strings out. Yeah. Is to stretch strings out. Well, one of the things when I was out on the road doing work for these guys, um, one of the things I wanted to make sure is that when they, when they started playing, everything was perfect. It was exactly where they needed to be. Yeah. And sometimes I'd be behind the scenes stretching the strings out on a new set if I string it the same day of the show. Yeah. I'm that person in the back stretching them out 10, 20 times before I hand it off to the guitar player yeah. to tell them to go to town. So stretching out your strings, incredibly important. And then locking tuners, I'm a big fan. I just wanted to, I yeah. just wanted to answer that question because some people are really biased against locking tuners for whatever reason. I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's, uh, a couple of things I also wanted to t talk about. Um, Switching gears for just a second. What should you look for when buying a guitar? A new or a used instrument? I mean, you like it, but uh, what, what are some things that as you physically have it in your hands and looking at it, what are some things that you should kind of pay attention to? So here's the thing. This is, this is a really cool tip, I think, you know, is there are guitars that y you want to like, and then there's guitars that you really like. Yeah. Okay. One alike for me are some big models from manufacturing companies, and I've had them, mm -hmm. but I don't play them because mm -hmm. I don't really like them. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of liking them. Yeah, you know. So that's the best tip I can give: is you have your guitar heroes, they play Les Paul, a Tele, Strat. This cat plays an SG, whatever it might be. That's cool. That's great. Just be sure that that's the guitar for you, because yeah. if you buy an instrument, you should gravitate towards it every day right because it's fun to play it should, it's it just fun to play you. man i can't yeah. put it down it's so much fun to play a lot of times that's not the same as the instrument you want to be seen playing yeah right yeah. so what i would say is 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 you know you might not be a les paul guy or mm -hmm. you might not be a strat guy or gal or whatever it might be pick the instrument that's right for you yeah pick the instrument that's right for you plug it in when you're at the music store get a good feel for it if you can't put it down because you love the way it feels, that's the guitar for you. Yeah. You know. Yeah. The other thing I would look for is, um, is um, well, price point is, is, a, is a pretty big thing, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't have to spend, you know, two, three thousand dollars to get a professional grade instrument. That's right. the reality of it. Right. You know? So um, picking out the right instrument that's right for you takes a long time yeah. and it might take a number of trips to a local music store. And I would almost guarantee it, you're, you're not going to fully love the instrument that you pick out out of a catalog, you know? that got to really get your hands on it. You really do. It doesn't really work. And I'm not hating on, 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 on catalog companies I've only bought one in instrument it's not that. without seeing it. It's just, you know, you don't, it, it, I mean, there's different neck profiles. I mean, even if we're going to talk Gibson Les Pauls and we have a wall full of them, you have different neck profiles. You have different feel the way it sits in your lap. It looks the same, but it could be a, a, a very different animal from one to the other. You want to pick out the instrument that's right for you. Yeah. You know? That's right for your body size. Mm -hmm. I remember I had a guy gave me uh, a guitar one time. It was, a, it was a beautiful Guild Jumbo. I hated the thing. <laughs> he gave it to me. He had it all set up. It was just brilliant. I hated it. Yeah. It was just big yeah. and bulky, yeah. and it's just not the thing that I grabbed when I was on my way out the door That's it. to start it to, to, for a night's worth of playing. Okay, so you want to look up on that wall of guitars, and you want to find your guitar. That's right. Okay, you want to find the one buried in that wall of guitars is the guitar that you're going to be sitting and playing in the dark on some night when you when you when you when you're feeling down. That's, that's the instrument that you want. You want to get the instrument that's speaking to you. That's right. Okay, no matter what, it, it's not the most expensive instrument. It may not be the prettiest instrument, but it's the one that speaks to you. That's the instrument that's right. you want to get. That's right. And sometimes you have to hunt a little bit. Sometimes you've got to hunt and wait. So, and the, the other thing that I'll say, too, is everyone, like, it's like um, brand loyalist, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, 
uh, Martin, Taylor, Fender, Gibson, right? Th those are great companies. Those are fantastic brands, and they're tried and true, and they're great, you know? But just because you have, you know, friends or whatever that gravitate towards one brand, mm -hmm. check out the other ones too, yeah. you know? You, you might be, you know, you might be a Martin guy or a Taylor or Larve or whatever it might be. There's different flavors out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, who knows, maybe that resonates with, with, yeah. with you better, you know? So d definitely, this is, a, this is a lone wolf, yeah. lone wolf kind of thing, you know? And pick what's right for you. Here's a, here's a little tip too. You play it, but then get somebody else to play it, and you sit back four feet and listen to it. That's true. Uh, a lot of times you can't necessarily get the, a, a true sound being, you know, at your player's vantage point. Another thing, uh, just on the practical end of things, take a good physical look at the instrument. If it's coming up right here, if there's a gap right here uh, on, let's say, an older instrument or something like that, that is a little, a small little sign of a, big, of a bigger issue. The instrument, as far as I'm concerned, when you purchase an instrument, whether it's new, used, vintage, especially vintage. Especially vintage. New, it's a different story, but used. There's, there's a big used market out there, you know? Mm -hmm. And every instrument should be in proper playing order prior to purchasing it. Mm -hmm. This shouldn't be a foreign of yeah. a concept, you know. Yeah. Every instrument needs to play perfectly in order for it to be a functional instrument. Mm -hmm. The fretwork needs to be solid. It needs to be set up well. It needs to have a new set of strings on it. Mm -hmm. That's how you make an instrument purchase, yeah. you know. And um, I mean, that, I, I feel that, that's the way I feel about it. I mean, you know, yeah. with, with groom guitars, I mean, that's why we have eight full-time repairmen upstairs to be Johnny on the spot and make sure that we give our customers a great buying experience in that way, yeah. you know? So, but that's what I, I wish for everyone, don't settle for whatever you have in front of you to say, well, this is what I got. Yeah. Baloney. It should be perfectly set up with new strings on it. And when you go home, it doesn't matter if you spend 250 bucks, 200 bucks, or $22,000, it doesn't matter. It should play perfectly well. Yeah, yeah. And you can get instruments to play well. Absolutely. Get them, get them set up. Now, it, guitar playing is hard enough. That's right. Without having a guitar that's fighting you back. That's right. So That's right. Especially, like, I mean, if you think about it, like, you, you, you give instruments as a present to, to parents that are giving it to their kids, little ones, you're starting them out, 10, 11, whatever, 8, 10, mm -hmm. 12, 15 years old, whatever it might be. These folks are just starting out, these little dudes, you know? They don't know what they're supposed to be feeling or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. If you put an instrument in their hands, that's uncomfortable to play. It might sour them exactly. from that instrument for life, Forever. for no good reason. Yeah. You know, for no good reason. That's why I th it's super, super important for me to make sure that every instrument that leaves this store is set up perfectly well so that when people receive them in the mail, they walk with it, whatever it might be, that it's right, that yeah. it's right. It's a, I don't want to get too, too esoteric with it, but in many cases, not in all cases, some people buy them like they would buy shoes. But an instrument is, is going to be something that you're going to be making music on. That's right. It's something that perhaps your kids will be inheriting and making music on. Um, it's, it's a relationship that you have with your instrument. It's worth finding the right, the right one because um, it's, it's important for your, for your uh, long-term musical life. You know, George was the one that kind of, open my eyes to this. This little piece of wood is going to last probably longer than I am. And uh, so you got to take care of, take care of these things. Yeah, I want to be able to give this to my kids, you That's know? Right. So uh, your music will go beyond just you. Just, to, just to, that one was for free. So anyway, thank you, Greg, for thank being you. a part of uh, a, a rather hectic night. Thanks for uh, uh, being with us. Uh, maybe we'll have to have you back again just to... Uh, uh, talk about some more stuff. Anytime. So um, keep up the great work and your learning. Hey, we will have a live lesson next week. I've got a good one for you. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a while, talking about how your guitar playing can make a difference. Not just, you know, being up on stage, but you can make a difference in your guitar playing. We're going to talk a little bit about music therapy, and we're going to have some experts in and talk about uh, the power of music and the power of guitar playing and what you you out there learning can do can use your playing to help some others. So this is going to be a rather different show next week, but it's going to be really, really great. And then after that, for the rest of February, I'm going to do three lessons in a row, and we're going to talk about one of the most uh,
pivotal, pivotal um, um, foundational uh, concepts, triads. And all the things that you can do, I'm going to show you various triads in major, various triads in minor, various triads in seventh chords, uh, but doing them as triads. So that's going to expand your playing. So when you see a C, you don't just go like everybody else does. You suddenly have 10 different options that you can do. It's going to blow your mind, your musical, expand your musical world. So we're going to do three lessons in a row on triads, and we're going to try and break the lid off of your, your uh, chord playing a little bit. So that's coming up later on in February. So thank you guys. Keep up the great work in your learning, and uh, we will see you all next time.